I'm going to show you how to make this map, which appears in GIS for Science Volume 3. This is the glorious David Rumsey map collection. Definitely check this out. I'm going to search for something specific here, forest density. And I know that what I'm looking for is on page 3. Check this out. United States forest density, 18... 83 density of existing forests oh my goodness just look at this beautifulness look at these lobes of forest in wisconsin and minnesota man look at this just shape of that mitten state handsome state wow okay so the density of forests also there's a really interesting hill shade baked into this kind of the caterpillar style hill shading that was common in the 1800s in a different pass in a red tint very very beautiful i want to download this thank you david rumsey for making this available to us in high resolution scans and ability to export so i'll take this um, i'll choose extra large and here it is a five megabyte image which looks like this Look at those water lines so here's the image and I am going to Photoshop out the tabletop and the book just to make it uh, retain only the tattered paper edge. And here it is with its contrast and saturation boosted a little bit because I think it looks better this way. Now here we are in ArcGIS Pro and I'm gonna choose, a well, first of all, I'm gonna geo-reference that map image because it's just an image. It doesn't know where it belongs, but a big first step is picking a projection that looks pretty close to whatever the vintage map was, which I don't know what projection it was. I'm gonna look for um, Lambert. I tried Elbers a minute ago and it wasn't quite right, it was close. So I'll try Lambert Conformal Conic. Continental, North America. North America Lambert Conformal Conic, USA Contiguous. That's the extent of my map. Let's, I mean, let's see how close it is. So here's Lambert, Continental United States. I'll now add my image. Here it is, all 38 megabytes of it. Now this is a transparent PNG, a PNG that has transparent edges because I remember I clipped out the book and the tabletop. Now, and by the way, that's an optional step. You don't have to do that. I just wanted to trim that out because I'm fastidious. So check this out, unknown coordinate system, no surprise. This is just an image, it doesn't know where it belongs. Let's see where it landed. Always kind of, whoo! Um, well, first of all, look what it did to my colors. So Pro has some imagery defaults that it will apply to your imagery. And it's really important that you be aware of this kind of thing. So with this layer selected, I'll go to appearance. I'm just gonna undo these defaults. The default for gamma is one. The, re, uh, the stretch type, right now it's doing a percent clip. So I lose, I think 20% on each end of the uh, pixel histogram here. So I'm going to do none. That's how it should look. and. The resampling type, this is an option. Nearest neighbor might give me some kind of pixely jagginess uh, when I pan and zoom. I want it to be cubic, so very smooth, soft. There we go, that looks good. I, uh, I'm curious where we are now. Lam Lambert conformal conic, it would have dropped it kind of in the middle, I would think. And indeed it did, right in the geographic center of the United States, kind of. Okay, it's time to geo-reference. I'll come back into my glorious map image and I've been doing a lot of this kind of thing lately, geo-referencing old maps, but it's fun. You should try it. It, uh, it breathes new spatial life into old vintage cartographic works. And I think there's something lovely about that. In the imagery tab, I'll choose geo-reference. Geo-reference is a system of pinning pixels in your image to real world coordinates. And then ultimately it stretches the map to fit where it ought to on the surface of the earth. Fr frankly, it's magic. I'm going to add control points. Those are the pins. So I like to start at the corners because mathematically that's probably the best way to go. And I'll start at the tip of the Olympic Peninsula and then pin it there as my starting point. And my end point is going to be the real world tip of the Olympic Peninsula, which is right now. And see how in that cute little postage stamp version of the map sitting at the tip of the peninsula? Okay, um, now I'm going to go, boy. Oh boy, these, um, the keys can be kind of inconsistent in these old maps. Well, let's t get the tip of Key West. <laughs> okay, from to. These first two points are the money makers. 
let's see, you know, it's like 95% of the work happens in these first two points. I'll make this semi-transparent so we can kind of see through. Okay, pretty good. You can see the border of Texas is a bit off. You know, the California-Mexico border clearly is, is off. We can pin that and look at Maine. Okay, well, we only did two corners and these are the opposite corners. So let's hit those corners. Okay, it's it's gonna take a fair amount of fine tuning. This was not a Lambert conformal projection. See the difference along the northern border between real life and the image. The peninsula of Michigan, the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan is off, and you can see this kind of El Paso shift happening down here in Texas. So uh, going on mute, and I'm gonna um, put in a ton of pins in fast forward. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, now I wanna show you something. I've got 13 pins put into this and I'm still using a first order polynomial. So I'll show you what this means. In the GeoReference tab, there's a transformation option and I'm using the most, you know, one of the most basic ones. It only requires three control points and it's just kind of like uh, stretching and rotating is all you get, but you don't get real rubber sheet sort of pliability with this. Um, this spline is straight up rubber sheet and it requires at least 10 control points, but we're at you know, 13, we can handle it. Let's see what happens uh, when I hit spline. So notice the green and red differentials here. It's saying I'm trying, I'm doing the work, but I've got some geometric errors. But when I do spline, it'll pin every Every one of those from origin to destination like a rubber sheet and we should see a lot of registration value now let's see all right this is very promising i'm just going to drop a few more along this northern border with canada and a few more along the texas border and i think it'll be plenty good enough for what we're using this for Plenty good enough for us. I will save this. And it doesn't save a new image optionally. It just saves all the control point information for this. And then I can stretch it into whatever projection I want thereafter, which is really amazing. And I'll close this. And I can get rid of my base map because we're done with that. We don't need this context and give this full opacity. Okay, we now have a geo-referenced map of existing forest density in such it was in 1883. Now we want to turn this 2D map into a 3D map, a global scene. And it's pretty easy to do that. I can just go to the view tab and choose convert to global scene. And that's that. We've got a 3D scene sitting on a an Earth sphere. And there's actually topography happening here. Real world elevation is pulled in from Living Atlas. You can't tell unless um, you decide to lie and go to the Appearance tab for the ground group and give it a vertical exaggeration of like uh, 20 madness. And there it is. We've got... Uh, some mountains in our old vintage map, but guess what? 
I'm not interested in real world mountains. I want to show mountains of forest as they are now. So we have a map of then, and I want to pull in some carbon data of now, right? Sounds crazy. I'm going to do this because it's crazy. I'll add data. And in ArcGIS Online, the US Forest Service has shared a really great layer called CONUS Total Carbon. CONUS is continental United States. Total carbon, here it is. CONUS Total Forest Carbon. It's pretty much the same map as this 1883 version, but with 2018 data. And conveniently, it's using a grayscale of black to white for the amount of local forest carbon, the density of forest carbon, which means we can trick ArcGIS Pro into thinking this is an elevation model. We'll use this elevation as the ground surface. Yeah. So I'm going to turn off the real deal and drag forest density into my elevation services group. And now we have an elevation based on forest carbon, but it looks really flat. That's because these are carbon units, not uh, geographic units. So we need to really crank up this vertical exaggeration until we can see something remarkable. I'm going to do it 12,000 times, 12,000 times vertical exaggeration. Ready? Let's zoom in. So we have a visual map of vintage forest density extruded by current forest density. Let's get a neat perspective. Okay, now we've got this white ball, a big marble that this is all sitting on. Let's make this look like, uh, like a tabletop. I'll add data. This time I'll go to Living Atlas and choose Global Background. My favorite layer. It's just a rectangle that covers the whole world. I'll drag it underneath my imagery, of course. And for its symbology, which is vector symbology, I'll give it a picture fill. And I'll make the size pretty big. I'm going to make it a thousand. And this is just a picture of some wood that I made that repeats. Now we're looking at the earth sitting on top of a table. And I'll get rid of the stars and halo. And I'll set the background to be black. Because we're not really looking at a planet anymore. Here I am in a layout. I've activated it so I can pan and zoom and stuff. I'll set up a cool perspective. Here, if I right click, I can drag it toward me. There. Now, um, this is a pretty small layout, which means the 3D level of detail isn't going to be super big, but there's a trick you can do. And by trick, I mean just total hack. So if I open the properties, I have this set to 19.2 um, by 10.8. Let me just double this. I'll do, um, I'll do points instead. I'll do, let's do. 3,000 by 1,500, like big. So this now is the size of my layout. And then I'll make the map frame fit. Actually, I can just snap it because it snaps now, which I love. See how it snapped? Snap. Okay, now when I export it, I'll very likely have a, a finer level of detail in the exported results. Okay, um, now I want to insert a rectangle. Put it here and I'll drag it beneath my map frame <clears throat> and I'll make it just solid black. Like I had a black background in the 3D map viewer itself. This is just kind of a way you have to hack a, a background color to cover a whole layout because the background cover color only applies to the map frame. Okay, now I've got a black background, it's starting to look kind of realistic. Let me hit control and I'll drag this rectangle up to make a copy of it. And I'm going to drag this one above the map frame. And yeah, you guessed it, I'm going to make a vignette because I can't help myself. So it's a map sandwich, a rectangle at the back, a rectangle at the front. I'll open its properties and I choose symbol and you can style this just like any old polygon. I'll give it a gradient fill. 
and its pattern I'll make hmm, so I'll, I'll do circular and instead of discrete which is stepped I'll make it continuous because it looks better that way and from black to white instead I'll make it from black to transparent black equaling vignette 100% transparent okay okay and let's just hit apply real quick to see what we're working with oh yeah look at that sense of drama such drama make this bigger I want to open this up a little bit so I'm gonna go into its color scheme properties and really fine-tune this I don't want it to start here and go all the way I want it to be really just visual at the end and I'll taper it off by adding another one and dragging that even closer to the edge so you've got just a little bit of vignettiness shade around the outside and then we can play with the size let's make it 85% of the layout Ooh, getting close um, 95 That looks pretty good. Now I have a smooth transition of, of shade instead of an abrupt end of the world. See what a little vignette does? I'll lock this. I'm going to activate this map. Now I can just fine tune its position. I've got the center scroll wheel depressed and you can really change the pitch and the yaw and the angle and whatever else pilots used to describe things. Thank you to the US Forest Service for the fun idea and the opportunity to collaborate. And I hope you try weird stuff with map making. Have a great day.